Welcome into another EC live show this Thursday, wherever you are around the emerging cricket world. I'm Daniel Beswick, joined by yet another fantastic guest. We've had an all-star cast, an all-star cast so far on EC Live. We had Daniel Weston last week, Kyle Kutz the week before, Shane Dietz, Tim Cutler so far. Another fantastic guest on tonight, and I'll introduce him in a moment. A couple of things to get through before we do sit down with Namibian men's captain, Herod Erasmus. A couple of news points. We drop our podcast tomorrow. We speak to Tim Brooks, uh, an author. He's got a brand new book out discussing associate cricket. We also discuss a range of associate cricket topics as well, so make sure to look out for that. Our T20 World Cup, sorry, our World Cup kit of polls has also been run and done. Congratulations to Vanuatu for taking out the competition, uh, beating Germany in the final. A lot of popularity in the hibiscus and the green kit there. Fantastic achievement by them. And a shout out to Shane Dietz and Melissa Farah and everyone involved in Vanuatu cricket with that. And finally, Patreon. Make sure to join our Patreon page from just $2 US a month. Uh, you can gain access to a, a range of extended chats and extended podcasts, and we'll have plenty of those over the course of the next couple of months, especially with very limited cricket around. But it is time to introduce our guest for tonight's show, and arguably one of the classiest bats in the emerging game, the Namibian men's team captain. He's been a part of the Namibian national setup for a decade now already, at just 25 as well, uh, plenty of years still left in him. Uh, Namibian men's team captain, Herat Erasmus. Thanks for joining the show. Hi, Daniel. Thanks, thanks guys, for having me. Oh, no problem. Um, I've, I understand that you've sort of spent a week away out in the bush. Um, Pierre de Bruyne has been very um, generous with you guys and letting you take a, a week off training. You guys have been hard at it over the last 12 to, to 16 weeks during the COVID period. I know it's been tricky, but I, I suppose that the general question is, how's it been for you guys? What have you been doing in the preparation? I know things have been tough. You guys have been doing, you know, gym routines with play equipment and stuff like that, doing workouts in your own house, training at your own houses. You've been able to train uh, with the team now. How's everything going and how are all the boys shaping up? Yeah, I think the boys are doing really well, actually. Um, we've had a, a good few months of training already. Um, we've been very fortunate to to get out and even though it's winter months in Namibia, we are fortunate to have very nice weather. Um, our days still go to about 22 degrees Celsius. So we're able to get out to our grounds and are able to prepare pitches plus in the net. So we're able to have surf nets, which is absolutely awesome for, for off season. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's the initially it was quite tough on the lockdown, uh, getting training routines going. Um, I think. Our training staff, our coaching staff did really well to be able to get us, uh, keep us together. Um, we at first started off uh, having all sorts of analysis, all sorts of team culture, um, girls. We did some things on, on mental toughness, on uh, sort of the mental side of the game, uh, really awesome chats in and amongst the boys, and really trying to, to gain more soft skills and those kind of things you need as a, as a professional cricketer. Um, something you don't always have time for and don't, don't always get to touch on while you're playing and while the schedule is busy. So we decided to use this time to, to get into those soft skills. Um, and Peter Brain and Albie Morka has been brilliant to help to us in the lockdown period, initially uh, getting all those things going. Um, our team culture is in a brilliant space. So um, we really enjoyed sort of touching on those things. And once we um, were able to, to get out, uh, really been nice training with we've, we've added uh, very busy in the nets uh, in our uh, strength and conditioning program has been up and running we've trained really hard and and therefore Pierre's rightly given some of the guys a, a off period here and there um as you know the mental mental side of the game is as important um and the the, the coaching staff are really managing us very nicely they you know it's a, quite a tough period for players if they don't have any game time they're unsure about their futures, um, all the worries that they have uh, in the back of their minds. They really supporting us the best they can. I understand they're back in South Africa at the moment. So you guys have, have basically had to have your regimented training regime in, on a sort of peer-to-peer -peer basis. And I understand Craig Williams is actually sort of running a lot of the sessions and helping out. Um, just thinking, you know, that takes a lot of discipline, but I'm sure you guys are all fighting for the, the same common, you know, um, goal, which is, you know, potentially a T20 World 
World Cup around the corner pending a lot of things. I know you guys were probably chomping at the bit to get going and the WhatsApp and, and the group chats were probably flying with messages and workouts and, and you know, time trials and times and stuff like that. Who's running the group chat at the moment? Who's providing all the banter, um, all the all the tough love in terms of um, getting you guys up to scratch? Yeah, WhatsApp's our best friend at the moment and so is Zoom meetings. Um, all the, the banter flying around on those have been quite brilliant. Uh, always have a very good team camaraderie. Um, uh, having to, uh, Pierre and Albi join us from Pretoria is, is always awesome. Then we can give them some, a bit of stick as well. Um, but all the guys are, are really trying to stay together. Um, we actually, uh, we've got Craig Williams. He's one of the boys that always gives a bit of stick. Uh, he doesn't shy away from any chat. Um, and then Stephen Bart, he's pretty clever with whatever he says. Um, but it's got, yeah, I mean, the boys are, are at training, the boys are really, really have a very friendly style. Um, even though we know it's tough times, we try and keep it very lighthearted and it's always quite, it's always good fun being in a team environment as opposed to being at home. Looking back, and, and we'll start with, I suppose, the start of 2019, because 2019 was a fantastic year for you guys. Um, on the field, um, achieved one-day international status again after winning uh, World Cricket League 2 at home. Um, you guys have performed pretty well so far in the World Cup League 2 as well, and you qualified for the T20 World Cup. It was essentially a perfect year for you guys. But to go back and to talk about that camaraderie that, that you've discussed, I remember when we were looking at the six teams playing in World Cricket League 2 last year, and Namibia were almost, even though they're the home side, almost, you know, the most unknown quantity there because a lot of the teams went out and played on very public tours. You know, we saw scorecards from everyone. You guys were a little bit more in-house. I remember you guys preparing in, in, in your part of the world and in South Africa as well. Um, but you guys came out and, and blew away the field at World Cricket League too, especially that match against Hong Kong is, you know, one of the things I remember quite fondly. But was that always the case? You guys, did you guys know you had something special there and then at the start of that 2019 camp? Because you guys kept it pretty hidden, but once you unleashed it, it was it was a sight to behold. Yeah, it was a, it was a special year, as you mentioned. Um, 2019 was definitely a turnaround year for us. Um, uh, as you say, I think rightly we were underdogs and sort of not favoured or put to to really do very well in that tournament. And rightly so, we uh, we had our previous World Cricket League stuff up, and uh, our track record wasn't good in that tournament. But uh, under the guidance of Pierre and Aldi, they came in, uh, Pierre Brain uh, created a new culture, team culture that that was um, very much based around um, you know pride and commitment and. All these special things that uh, weren't necessarily mentioned on here, uh, and those things started going deep into the team. And I think, as you said, uh, whether it feels uh, sort of secretive to you guys, you could see from from the side that this team was uh, very much together, and they they had a mental capability of playing tournament cricket now. Um, and then from from then on, we sort of just kicked on through the tournament, and we and, and it actually started quite roughly as well. Um, I mean, the first game against Papua New Guinea, we only just chased down 127 or something with seven down. And then the second game, we had another loss against um, USA, uh, where we should have actually um, taken it comfortably. Uh, and those were our tests. And then from then on, we didn't really look back the rest of the tournament. We had an error loss to Oman, but uh, uh, that was, I think, uh, quite a tough toss to lose. Uh, I think it was the fourth or the fifth game. And then the last two days, which is absolutely special, it was it was um, beating uh, was it sorry Hong Kong on on the bus field with massive we scored about four hundred and yeah about one hundred and thirty runs. That was that was special. That was where all the work that Pierre and the team had put in um, came off, and we really saw saw our fruits coming off there. And then what a celebration it was to beat the man in the final in front of our, our own fans and our own special people who've always been around. Yeah, I've noticed it's very much a family effort and, and we know about your father, Francois, who, who's always been around the Namibian setup and has been 
for, for a very long time, but a lot of notable ex-players were, were always around at the ground, either watching on or giving their advice as well. You guys also had H.D. H. Ackerman work with you guys um, in the coaching role. And he was, you know, he was almost a little bit uh, flabbergasted by, you know, just how tough and how tricky associate cricket can be, you know, to, to look back at, at World Cricket League too, you know, and to look at, say, uh, Canada who weren't quite as lucky, you know, that's a tournament where careers are at stake. And you guys, again, you had that narrow loss against USA, the, the second game of the tournament. But you guys fought valiantly to come back and, and I, I suppose recover from that that 400 you guys put up against Hong Kong, which I still don't think is the right score on, on some of the scores around. I'm pretty sure Tim Cutler and I sort of counted it. And you guys actually might have been dudded about 10 or 15 runs. I think you guys might have made over 400. But that was a special day where everything came together. And Pierre talks about, you know, when I spoke to him last, he talked about momentum and the importance of momentum. So carrying that from from match to match and then you guys in the final against Oman you know ran them ragged I remember Jan Freiling took a bunch of wickets and and finished that off you know quite strongly um but to talk about I suppose the cutthroat nature of associate cricket what does that that pressure do to you guys because it looked like you guys really embraced that challenge and and being at home you you tried to make the most of of that I suppose advantage as well yeah um definitely uh, well cricket league tournaments are um they're synonymous with pressure. You, you know that it's um, the future of the cricket in the country. It, it, uh, to be honest, it's a, a lot of money at stake. Um, it's a lot of futures at stake. It's a lot of young kids that want you to play well because you want cricket in the country. Um, but when you go out and play, you, you've got to put that to bed at first and know that there's a game at hand. And I think from previous experiences playing in the World Cricket League tournaments, we always try to just hold on and, and and just sort of stay in the tournament. And that was a really negative mentality. Um, so it was this time, even though we had lost a few games, we felt that in the 2019 tournament, we really played most of the cricket. We really went out positively and we um, threw the first punch. We we played most of the cricket and, that, and we had deserved to qualify and we had deserved to play in the final. And then when the final came around, then you could see who was the best team at the tournament. Um, so compared to the other tournaments, I think this one we went out to play the cricket. Uh, and other tournaments, perhaps we stood back and just felt felt away a bit at this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a nice tournament to play in. I mean, as Albi Moko said, the T20 qualifier, for example, is there's only something to gain. There's not something to lose really. It's just yeah. that you don't go play in the World Cup, but there's just a prize at stake. You can go play in the World Cup. Um, so the cricket league tournament. It's different. Uh, you don't want to go one down. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about uh, the, the T20 World Cup qualifier that you guys just competed in, in in a couple of moments. But now the alternative to the World Cricket League is Cricket World Cup League 2 for you guys. So it's a, a seven-team tournament. You guys play 36 one-day internationals over the course of a two-and-a-half to three-year period. Um, all one-day international status as well, which is is great for you guys. It gives you guys the recognition that you deserve as well. I, I suppose on a on a personal front, it, it also gives you a little bit, you know, you a little bit of peace of mind knowing that, you know, you've got those one-day internationals in the bank. You guys can you, you receive that ICC funding as well. Um, your immediate futures aren't thrown out on the line. Yeah, assuming that we get all these matches in eventually, because it will be over the next say two years. How important is that for you guys to be able to have 36 one-day internationals locked in the bank, knowing that you're going to get them, and, and you guys are going to develop in that two- to three-year period playing all those matches? Yes, absolutely brilliant. In the social world, always um, one more opportunity to play, one more opportunity to go, go up in the ranks. Um, and that 2019 tournament, the prize was massive, um, uh, 36 30 hours and set cricket for the next couple of years. And amount of money for your for your governing body to work with that was that was really a great prize to have and uh, hopefully we can benefit from that now the the next prize is to um get on the top of that log and uh, hopefully qualify again for for the world, next world cricket league and have more futures um you know secured a, around the around the country and have another uh, two or three year period of quality cricket and hopefully spread the game spread the numbers of cricket in the Mazia. um that's what the Obviously, the cash does around. Uh, you can you can do something with it, um, 
and you know the the local people they they really enjoy cricket so we've been privileged to have a nice administrative side that have branded cricket around in the last uh, year or so uh, they've done a brilliant work work um, the CEO and the board uh, they see planning and uh, they can yeah you know the financial side around it has, has really been uplifted over the last year or so uh, we've had the close connections with the titans they've come over for a t20 tournament so that kind of branding has been brilliant over the last year so and i mean we can only um if we qualify again we can only take that brand forward yeah we'll, we'll talk about uh i suppose that that brand moving forward as you say and, and it has looked very conscious effort you guys have gone around in the community and done a lot of stuff you've done the, the road show and it looks as if you guys have got the sponsors in and around. Um, we'll probably talk about that in, in a couple of moments, but to continue with the 2019 chat, you know, the World Cup qualifier for you guys ended up being brilliant, you know, beating Oman to, to qualify in that particular match in the in the playoffs towards the business end of the tournament. But you guys actually started, you know, Norton 2 to, to start things off. You had that loss against the Netherlands and then a pretty bad loss against Papua New Guinea as well. And then you guys have to come up against Scotland next and, and knowing that, you know, going 0-3 would probably mean the end of, of your campaign. Um, you guys fought valiantly, you made a couple of changes, but it looked as if you guys found the right balance come at that point of the tournament and you made the most of it moving forward through that tournament. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, more than fair enough. I think after that 0-2, um, we, we were staring down the barrel and we were playing Scotland who we were supposed to be Sort of favourites alongside that Netherlands um, in the in the T20 qualifier. Uh, so it wasn't a nice place to be in. But at that stage, I think we had to create some clarity within the team about our roles. We had to create clarity uh, of the, the way forward. Um, and I think we did that. We had decided that um, only us ourselves, only the players, can get ourselves out of this mess. Uh, I mean, we have been by Papua New Guinea. They scored 180 and, uh, on quite a slow wicket um, and we only managed about 100. Uh, so, and I mean, we beat them in the World Cup in the, in the, in the warm-up game. We, we felt pretty confident against them. Um, the, the first match against the Netherlands, we, we dealt them to respect 130 on a good wicket and then they um, their opening bowlers blew us away. So, I mean, both those losses actually sank in very deep after after we'd actually gained some nice momentum before the tournament. So we really didn't feel like we came in undercooked or anything in the tournament. It was just that the nature of T20 cricket um, blowing us away the first two games. Um, and I mean, we did get blown away properly the first two games. We had to resurrect that ourselves. Um, I think the clarity within the team, um, we had to get our own performance aside. We had to take ownership and responsibility. and um, and luckily, some of the guys did take that accountability to, to perform their, in their roles. And I think once we got the momentum going, as you said, we managed to, to get it going against Scotland, who were proper side at that tournament. Um, I think then we, we had sort of easier fixtures in the middle, and that, that, that's it maybe a good build up for us. I mean, in terms of if you want to peak at the right time. Um, and we were lucky enough to do that. So, I mean, it ended up being in, against a man where we more or less played 90 to 95% of our, of our perfect game. Yeah, well, you look at that that team that you guys have in, in the T20 format, and you've got a lot of balance in the 50-over format as well, but it must be said in the T20 format, you guys have, you're looking at the balance all the way down, you know, those quality from, from 1 to 11, you know, Nico Davin opening the batting with, with Stephen Bard, Bard's kind of that, that anchor, but then you have... JP Kotter, who can go, we've seen him do that at both T20 international level and one day international cricket. You know, when he gets going, you know, there's not many people that can stop him and yourself and Craig Williams in that middle order. And then you have, you almost have two players in one with JJ Smith, who has the most outstanding inside out cover drive I've ever seen. I just can't get over how good that is. But then you've got the bowling as well. You know, Frylink, um, Smith as well, bowling left arm um, pace. But then you've got, you know, Christy Villon as well. And then the left arm spin of uh, Zhivago Gronwald and, and Bernard Schultz as well. And then you've got, you know, your off spin when you want to use that, you know, whenever as well. So you've kind of got all bases covered. Looking at the World Cup, you know, and assuming that it goes ahead either this year or next year, you guys are in the Hobart group. It's a tricky, it's a tricky group. There's no easy opponents at this level, of course, but 
having, you know, the likes of Bangladesh, um, Scotland and the Netherlands in that group, it will be a tricky group. But do you kind of see that as an opportunity for you guys to, to get a couple of scalps and move into that Super 12 phase? Oh, absolutely. I think the Super 12 phase is definitely the first goal. Um, I always say if we pitch up at the tournament, then you pitch up to win it. Um, the first, first, first goal would be to get into the Super 12 phase. And um, I think Scotland, we've played Scotland, Netherlands quite a bit before. Um, and I think there's nothing unexpected from the, from the Bangladesh side. We would have seen lots of footage of them beforehand. And obviously going into that game, we'll be underdogs and we'll be perhaps a bit less known to them. So I think uh, that group is tough. As you say, the other group will be just as tough. Um, and it's T20 cricket if you pitch up. And as I say, if we have clarity in our roles uh, and those guys take responsibility, they perform. Um, if we can get a nice positive mind frame going before the tournament and speak at the right time, then I think T20 cricket, uh, it just takes a bit of muscle, a bit of luck here and there, and you should be through <laughs> Yeah, that that's certainly true. And and looking at Bangladesh, there's a good chance, you know, Shagi Hassan's not there pending, you know, his uh, ban from the ICC at the moment. But yeah, it, it is almost an advantage to you guys that you know much more about them than they know about you. You would uh, agree with that? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's the kind of energy we have to roll on uh, going into their game. It won't be nice for them. Uh, not knowing, you know, maybe a small country from Africa is. Um, and we'll do that. I mean, fair enough. We'll Definitely use that. I think besides Shakit, there are so many more cricketers in their country to pick from. Um, but it'll be just a great opportunity to get our first test goal. Um, we had a small opportunity in the Dubai Stadium against Ireland. Uh, we couldn't put through. Um, but I mean, the first game against Bangladesh would be what a nice opportunity to do it in front of the world. Now, I want to bring in this picture because th this is your father and, and I, I don't think it takes a genius to work out that, that you guys are related there with the resemblance but during the t20 world cup qualifier he was one of the the very few namibians there sort of watching from the stands he's been involved in namibian cricket for a very long time and i'm sure he was a big influence in, in getting you into cricket I want to ask, does he know someone involved in the ICC camera work? Because I think he got more attention on the TV than you did at that particular tournament. Yeah, he was also only one of five supporters there, so um, <laughs> from an Namibian side. So fair enough. Um, yeah, he was actually sitting, sitting on the in the on the balcony there with uh, all the wives and girlfriends, and um, yeah, I mean the Grey Fox got a what a great man to have at your game. And you know, he really enjoyed it. I mean, as you say, he's done years of work with, with cricket in the he's, he's only done a lot of the love for the game. And he was actually more of a rugby guy back in his playing days. So he's only really done it because he loves sports, because he loves Namibia in general, because he loves um, uh, influencing and helping people. And um, yeah, I, I think that was... That was one of the special moments for him, along with the 2003 World Cup where he was manager. Um, I think he, he really enjoyed it. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he's come a long road, not only with uh, on the administrative side, but he's got some uh, very personal relationships with everyone around and in the cricket community. And they've, they've seen the work he has done. And he's, uh, yeah, he's really, he really does enjoy his cricket and does enjoy the team. I'm glad you bring up that 2003 World Cup because when you guys gained one day international status again last year, it was the first time in 16 years with the last time being that 2003 World Cup. Do you Are they your sort of first memories of cricket watching your guys play in South Africa at the, at the World Cup? Was that one of your big inspirations to pick up a, a ball and bat so young? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, in being manager, I was in and around the... Uh... Um, you know, those players at the time, so uh, at their home games, at the uh, training room, all that kind of stuff. I was always in and around there, just mucking about. So those were the first guys I actually knew in a sports sense as uh, people that I looked up to. And definitely once I saw them on TV, um, and later on I went to go watch a few games because it was next door in South Africa, uh, I definitely enjoyed seeing them. and, and it definitely gave me some inspiration to also want to play for Namibia. Um, yeah, just, uh, some of them were some of my coaches back then. 
uh, that Cricket Academy has been done to it. And yeah, that was, that was just brilliant to see them on a world stage. Um, obviously, they didn't do so well in the tournament, but um, all the stories and all the, um, yeah, everything they, all the experience they brought back to Namibia was just something that, that kicked on, that made Cricket kick on a bit more in Namibia. And um, yeah, it was very nice to have. Yeah, I remember they held their own um, well and truly against teams like England at that World Cup. And I, I thought it was a great indicator for the ICC moving forward, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, the numbers of teams at the 50 over World Cups would either stay at that level or even grow into the future. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. And looking at you guys uh, in Namibia, cricket and rugby are, are two big sports in the country. And we've see we see Namibia play at the Rugby World Cup almost every four years. They they played in the tournament last year. Is it a little bit frustrating knowing that you know comparatively and relatively you guys are, are roughly at the same level in terms of say world rankings and and where you guys sit in terms of where you would rank um, out of say twenty in the international world of, of cricket and rugby? But they get to play in a World Cup every four years, and in the fifty over World Cup, you guys haven't had that opportunity and it's not been down to a lack of ability or effort. It's just a case of the numbers being smaller. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's quite a frustration and always a bit of banter between me and my mates who play rugby for them. Yeah. Um, but then again, I, I so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the ICC's decisions over the years that have been quite disappointing to us. Um, uh, but I think we've, we've got many more opportunities in between. Um, the, uh, I think the, the amount of traveling and the amount of cricket we play in between um, stacks up a bit against there. So they only have those opportunities once every four years and then a two a year and there every now and again. Um, so definitely on the world stage, as you say, they've got brilliant opportunities to play in front of, uh, in front of the world. And any of them have, have made a career out of just playing World Cups and then getting signed wherever in the world. So that's it. It is quite a frustration, yes. At, at only 25, and you've been in the role for, for a little while now, you've been involved in the Namibian setup for almost 10 years now. Um, on a personal front, what's the, the ultimate goal for you? Where do you think you can take Namibian cricket in the next 10 years or so? Oh, well, definitely to do well at the T20 World Cup first if I only think about the next few months. And then hopefully to qualify for another few T20 World Cups for as many as we can um, to really leave a legacy that we that we can take forward, you know, that uh, many more kids in, in the years coming can play cricket number them. We can spread the game to to the population. Uh, it's one of the main targets and one of the main challenges in Namibia. Um, so as a, as a captain, I really do enjoy, um, you know, having a, having a, building a legacy around here. We started off really well, as you say, in 2019. And this bit in 2020 has been tough, but we, uh, as we go forward, I think over the next five to 10 years, that we leave a legacy for youngsters to play. Um, and then on a personal front uh, and as, as a team, we would like to qualify for every tournament we can, uh, 50 over World Cup, uh, also one of the main fruits we'd like to, to get there. Uh, that's obviously uh, not up to us always. Uh, it just seems to get um, tougher and tougher to qualify for one of those. Um, and yeah, on a personal front, uh, hopefully play play somewhere around the world as well, um, try and, and, and make it very nice professional career out of it. Yeah, looking at some of the the fan questions coming in, a lot of the stuff's been answered already, which is which is great. But uh, one from Ankit Tawari, he wanted to know who the toughest bowling attack in the emerging world is. He he's thrown up Namibia. I'm sure there's a vested interest in there, and and all the countries around the world have differences, subtle differences in their bowling. Without you know, you giving away too much information to some of your opponents, maybe some ammo for, for some of the opposition teams. What are the challenges that, that you come up against against some of the, the different teams in the associate world? Yeah, sometimes it really does depend on conditions. Um, if we have low and slow conditions like we've had at previous tournaments in Namibia, um, 
the Nepal boys have been tough to face. They had the brilliant um, Sandeep Plimachani over here, and he, he wreaked havoc amongst batsmen on those wickets. Um, and then I think a good ba um, balanced bowling attack like the Netherlands, uh, they continuously put pressure on you in T20 cricket. They've got um, relentless opening bowlers, uh, and then they've got old and wily skills in the middle, um, and they're a very professional side. So I think those two come to mind. Um, but I mean, it's, it's all those challenges in different parts of the world. It's, you always find them. Uh, I think all the teams have the army these days to play an extra spinner or an extra seamer, depending on the on the conditions. And you, as a bat, batting unit, need to figure out how you're going to combat that. Uh, it's, the, it's those constant changes you can make, and those constant the, the way you can pitch up at different tournaments and in different conditions with your set of skills um, that will make you a better team or a better, better personal cricketer at the end of the day. So, yes, uh, the Nepal boys have have had the fair share of, of World Cricket League um, wickets. The Sonny Blamishani has, has done well and uh, only shows how far he's gone in, in the World Cricket that he's a quality player. And just perhaps as a, as a follow up to that, you know, we've seen JJ Smith um, drafted in the the Canadian T20 Global Franchise League, um, playing in that T20 World Cup qualifier last year. You guys were, were uh, playing in front of a, a global, a worldwide audience with plenty of people tuning in from around the world, and I'm sure there are a lot of you know very interested people looking to pick up perhaps you know a bargain in in future uh, franchise leagues around the world. Is that something that that it plays into the mind of of an associate player i'm sure that you know international success and team success is well and truly at, at the forefront of, of your mind being say a national team captain but you know looking down the track you know say we do get a t20 world cup played in australia at the end of the year and you guys the namibians put in a really good team performance perhaps down the line you know there's a chance that a couple of you guys also get picked up in a few of the franchise leagues around the world is that something that you guys would potentially, you know, look forward to? Because I'm sure as associate cricketers, you guys, you know, you, you want to be paid for, for your services as professional cricketers, and that would be yet another avenue for, for some income coming in. Yeah, most definitely. Um, they always say that cricket is um, team sport played by many individuals, and I think everyone in our team understands that as that as well. We've got a brilliant team culture, and in that we've got um, one of our values being selfless. Everyone understands that you got to make a career out of out of cricket, and they understand that if we play well collectively, it could also mean that some players get more opportunities elsewhere in the world. So everyone understands that um, playing on the world stage for each individual is also one of the ultimate goals. Uh, all of the players will definitely be happy for anyone um, playing in themselves into a contract at the World Cup or playing themselves into a contract at the uh, T20 qualifiers. So everyone really looks forward to uh, the next JJ Smith, someone who can get into the global T20, get into the tournaments around the world. And as you say, it, it, it can be just around the corner. The, all, all the scouts and the agents are definitely looking at T20 cricket uh, tournaments. Uh, we play lots of tournament cricket, so I think we well equipped to playing well in tournaments. We're well equipped to uh, knowing what it, what what it needs to to win tournaments, um, to do well at tournaments. So I think we. Uh, this was probably one of the years with so many cricket and so many T T20 cricket on the schedule that many of our players would have liked to to make it and uh, and you know get those personal goals and milestones up there, get some stats behind your name. Um, but it, it hasn't hasn't happened and that's unfortunate. But hopefully next year there will be lots of fixtures to use those opportunities. And as you say, the T20 World Cup being the first one um, as you go forward, we're both training for that one. Um, Hopefully, someone can do really well there and um, yeah, make make something out, of it, make a professional career out of it. Well, a stat that that bodes well for you, and and just looking at it as part of the the research for today, outside of Paul Sterling, no one scored more runs at the T Twenty World Cup qualifier than you, Harald. So, well done on that. Make sure you know it's been a joy to to follow Namibian cricket, especially after you know over the last few years. Um, being in Namibia for World Cricket League Two last year was a joy to behold hopefully you know some brides down the track um some some glory days in namibia um thanks so much for joining us and being a part of the emerging cricket movement and we'll hopefully hear from you very soon thank you very much for having me daniel and
to see you all. No problem, Herard. Again, guys, before we let you go, make sure to uh, subscribe to the Emerging Cricket Podcast wherever you do listen to it as well. A new pod drops tomorrow with Tim Brooks, uh, an author with his new book. If you are watching this on YouTube as well, make sure to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. But once again, uh, on behalf of Herard Rasmus, I'm Daniel Beswick, and thank you for tuning in once again to another EC Live.